Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions, brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here is Phil Mackesy. Rick Rule specializes in natural resources. He's founder of Global Resource Investments, a member of the Sprott Group of Companies, and he's online at SprottGlobal.com. He's coming to us today from Carlsbad, California. Rick, it's always good to have you back on This Week in Money. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's talk gold. It's closing in on 1800 today, uh, up almost 5% in September, 6% in August. Looks like it is back in rally mode. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think what we saw in the gold market early uh, was simply a cyclical decline in a secular bull market. It's pretty obvious that uh, central bankers around the world are at least inadvertently doing what they can to take the gold price higher. And I, I think that happens for two principal reasons. One, gold is, of course, denominated for most people in fiat currencies, the dollar, the euro, whatever. And as the value of the denominator, in other words, the fiat currency declines, the nominal price, at least, of gold increases. The second thing is that gold is both a medium of exchange and a store of value. Uh, And that is a unique combination as money. Most other types of money are only mediums of exchange or promises to pay. But gold is, in fact, payment. During times of crisis or perceived crisis, Uh, throughout history, really recorded history, gold, because it is a store of value as well as a medium of exchange, uh, has served a purpose when people don't trust other mediums of exchange. It's interesting to note that despite the fact that gold is usually viewed as an an inflation hedge, pardon me, uh, that gold has done well in terms of crises that were either inflationary or deflationary. And I think as a consequence of people's probably deserved nervousness mm-hmm. about the state, of the, the state of the global economy, that gold prices are doing well. Rick, I love this quote I saw from you on the Internet. When people don't trust each other, they trust gold. Well, I think that's, <laughs> that's proven to be accurate over time. Uh, as I say, it, it isn't the promise to pay. It's not like a check. Gold is, in fact, payment. It isn't a, a receipt for something. Now, the main driver of this increase over the summer has got to be uh, quantitative easing, or as you're calling it, a a competitive devaluation. Yeah, competitive devaluation is what I called it four or five years ago when it was part of economic policy designed to stimulate employment. You recall on your own program that I talked about the fact that uh, gold was the only normal medium of exchange that didn't have a political constituency for devaluation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think competitive devaluation has gone to something far more serious now. What I see they're describing as quantitative easing, I would describe as counterfeiting. It's a very different word. I realize that technically, if the government prints it, it isn't counterfeiting. But the fact is greatly increasing the amount of specie without having the underlying economy generate more value either by way of goods or services means that you are debasing the currency, which is in fact counterfeiting. It's very worthwhile to know that under the guise of adding liquidity to the system, one of the things that governments around the world are doing, yours being a notable exception, is printing money to buy newly issued government securities. Put a different way, they have to print to buy their current liabilities because no rational investor in their right mind would buy them. So really, I see competitive devaluation giving way to giving way to counterfeiting. We're talking to Rick Rule here on This Week in Money and a quote here from uh, your friend uh, John Embry. This is interesting. You're talking about the amount of manipulation going on in gold right now. What's going on here? Well, John and I have different views there. Um, I don't give the alleged manipulators uh, credit for enough moxie and intelligence to pull off a manipulation. Uh, I, I certainly hope I'm right and that John isn't right. Uh, we have this discussion often, and he's probably, well, not probably, he's definitely a better student of markets than <laughs> I. I can only say that uh, hanging around the Vancouver Stock Exchange in my formative years and seeing plenty of manipulation, yeah. a conspiracy of the type that they describe seems very, very, very difficult to me. Uh, while I won't give them any particular credit for evil genius, uh, I might give them credit for insane stupidity. There are probably large short interests against gold on a global basis, but I have a difficult time understanding the conspiracy and manipulation that's argued even by my own firm. Well, what about John's statement that we're now in the end game? What do you think of that? 
Uh, I'm afraid I think he's right. I certainly hope we're both wrong. Uh, I don't know how this sort of thing will play out. What we are is in a situation where, at least in Western economies, we've lived beyond our means for the better part of two and a half decades, and people have grown very accustomed to it. When we sort out a situation where society has lived beyond its means, and we sort who will be the winners and the losers in the political process, that's extremely messy. Bill Bonner pointed out a couple years ago when describing the uh, Greek uh, situation that there were three potential large groups of uh, victims. One would be the savers, i.e. the bondholders. The second would be the entitlement beneficiary. And the third would be the producers or taxpayers. And when he was asked which he thought would be the victim, he simply said yes all the classes would sure. be victims. And it's going to be difficult to sort that out. And so we may very well be in some form of end game. It seems like we are looking at just endless amounts of quantitative easing, and that has got to be in itself good for gold. I would suspect that's right. As I say, for two reasons. One, uh, certainly people have less and less trust in the system. And it would appear to me for good reason. But secondly, remember that gold, at least in our economies, are denominated in dollars. And if you make the dollars worth less, at least the nominal price of gold rises. Rick, is there anything you can see coming up that is going to bring the price of gold down? It, it doesn't seem like it, does it? Well, I would suspect if we had some form of political accommodation. I mean, you know, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to speak for Canada, except to say that Canada had the extreme good fortune of having their debt crisis in the early 90s uh, and, and dealing with it at that time. I think the institution of your national sales tax to make the uh, tax system more inclusive was, at least in the context of a Canadian democracy, a good thing. And, of course, you had the benefit of high oil prices. Mm-hmm. But with the real problem being Europe and the United States, uh, in order for the gold price to come down, some very interesting things would have to happen. One thing is that you would have to greatly reduce the net present value of future unfunded liabilities, like pensions, like health. And I don't see a situation where the citizenry who believe themselves to be entitled to that kind of thing would decide voluntarily, voluntarily, pardon me, to live within their means. Uh, you would certainly have to deal with the existing on balance sheet liabilities. I suspect they will attempt to deal with those by inflating them away. But it appears to me that the combination of the on-balance sheet and off-balance sheet liabilities are too great to inflate away. But somehow you need to make the uh, overhang uh, of liabilities. uh, You need to reduce the overhang of liabilities. And I think the third thing that you would need to do would be allow for a cleansing in capital markets uh, to eliminate, you know, the sort of propensity that the big banks mm-hmm. have to make these mistakes on purpose, the sense that they're too big to fail. You have to let some of them fail. And you need to roll back the level of regulation so that you can grow your way out of the remnants of the problem. And unfortunately, I don't see any of those prescriptions yeah. being adopted by anybody Uh, in the near or intermediate future. I suspect they'll all come to play in the aftermath of what I think will be a very messy set of resolutions to these problems. Doesn't seem to be much political will, Rick, to to clean up these problems. As you say, the the, the solutions will be forced on us by by essentially by fate. Sure. The, uh, you know, my my favorite uh, political commentator of all times was the cartoon strip character Pogo, He said something to the effect of, uh, I have seen the enemy, and he is us. You know, we elect these slobs, after all, and uh, they're doing our bidding. Ambrose Bierce famously said, you understand politics by looking at the root of the word. Poly, the Latin for many, meaning ourselves. And ticks, of course, from the English for small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> the process is a process by which we all try and steal from each other while sheltering ourselves from theft. And it, it truly is a zero-sum game. So trying to solve what are human action problems politically is probably doomed to failure in some fashion. 
Rick Rule, our guest on This Week in Money. Rick, let's talk about the guys who dig gold out of the ground for a living. Great run over the summer. Could it be time now to take some money off the table in the mining sector? I think so. Uh, In particular, I would be uh, selling your mistakes. We're going to have a real serious tax loss selling season in December. Mm -hmm. There's no sense uh, waiting. I would beat the rush and sell into this rally. And then I would probably add some positions in December when everybody else is selling. I I need to say, however, that I believe we are genuinely in a stealth bull market for the best 5% of the juniors. It won't feel like it because probably, well, probably more than half the juniors uh, are still identified by John Kaiser's great article as uh, selling for less than 20 cents, uh, selling for substantially below half of 52-week highs, and having less than six months' worth of working capital remaining, which tells you that uh, a very large number of the companies on the TSXV are in fairly eminent danger of extinction. What that would mean is that Although the best companies uh, are in a bull market, they're few in number. So it will feel to us like the bear market is continuing because the vast majority of the issuers will be headed towards their intrinsic value, which is, of course, zero. Rick, is that pointing us towards more mergers and uh, acquisitions in the mining space? Hopefully. The amount of general and administrative expense that goes into these multiple listings is frightful. The idea that the junior capital markets are an efficient way to explore is silly. And we would do well to have 2,000 less listings on a global basis. Rick Rule is founder of Global Resource Investments. It's a member of the Sprott Group of Companies, and he is online at SprottGlobal.com. Rick, always a pleasure. Thanks for talking to us today. My pleasure. Thank you. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Sean Broderick is editor of Red Hot Global Resources and Global Resource Hunter from Weiss Research. Check out Sean's blog at UncommonWisdomDaily.com. Hey, Sean, it is always fun to have you on This Week in Money. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. Speaking of fun, Ben Bernanke back in the news this week says that short-term interest rates are going to stay at nearly zero, and he's just going to keep at it until the economy strengthens uh, or, or the money's gone. I can see why everybody's calling this thing QE infinity. Wow. And yet some people want to stand in the way of that. And they're bearish as all get out. I just don't understand it. I mean, if because uh, he's not the only central bank, right? Sure. And uh, the others are also uh, saying, well, we'll just print till the cows come home. Why would you possibly want to stand in the way of that? Why would you want to get bearish right now? I mean, there could be some outside catastrophe that changes things. But, you know, short of an asteroid hitting the planet, yeah. you know, what the hell is going to make the market go down at this point? So why is Bernanke kind of stepping out of uh, his role saying things like this at this point? Oh, well, because he's absolutely uh, disgusted with the way Congress has not done its duty. I mean, it's just sitting there because Republicans in Congress don't want to give Obama any credit for any job. So they refuse to, uh, you know, actually um, do anything to create jobs like, say, infrastructure spending. So they're not going to get anything done. So since they aren't going to create jobs, Bernanke says, well, you know what, I will, or at least I will make the economic environment conducive to the creation of jobs. And so that's basically what he's he's doing. He is just blasting enough liquidity around the system Mm -hmm. that he's thinking, you know, these things really have to start rolling. Things will unfreeze and we'll see some real economic momentum start to pick up. Um, It's not the way you would choose it if you're going to do it, you know, there is probably a better plan, but since he can't get the better plan done, he has to go with plan B. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Speaking of a better idea, tell us about this uh, this report you've got, Get Rich Rebuilding America. What's that all about? Well, after the election, I expect that uh, the Republicans won't care if Obama gets credit for jobs, even if he's in the Oval Office after his recent debate performance. Who knows, <laughs> right? But no matter who is in the Oval Office, they don't care who gets credit for jobs. Uh, So I think we'll see more cooperation, and the thing everybody needs to cooperate on is to actually um, build infrastructure across the country. We have bridges that are falling down, roads that are potholed, uh, and also in the U.S. anyway, I don't know about up in Canada, we have one, one, like, failure of the power grid after another. Mm -hmm. So um, all those things need to be fixed, and so... What that report is about is the stocks that should do well after the election, 
uh, when uh, we start to see some spending on infrastructure. So I think we will do that. Those stocks are holding up nicely now, but then everything's going up. I just think they have a chance for real outperformance after the election. Now, speaking of the election, the only r- result that counts, obviously, is the one in the voting booth. But uh, everybody picking winners uh, today on who won the debate. The clear winner, obviously, uh, Mitt Romney. But don't you feel these guys are, are pretty much the same in their approach? Well, he won on style. Yeah. Uh, he didn't win on substance, but America is the style civilization. So, you know, you have to give it to Romney. Um because he knows how to appear, you know, strong and forceful and all that stuff, whereas Obama came off as a lecturing college professor, Mm -hmm. and uh, nobody wants to be lectured to. So um, Obama, now, I have since seen videos from the last time he was running for election. He actually isn't a good debater. He's not. So people who are expecting, um, you know, him to really turn things around and come back, in the second debates, I think they're just kind of maybe uh, maybe they should <laughs> think about something else because he's probably not going to get that much better. Um, but maybe he could at least come to a point without wandering all over the place. That would be good. But on substance, I mean, and this is one thing that could come back to haunt Romney. Yeah. Romney, the the Romney that was on the podium was not the Romney that's been running for president for the last few months. In fact, I think that's one of the things that really threw Obama is he came prepared to, you know, have a debate with a Romney that had been running for president, but it was a brand new Romney. Mm-hmm. This Romney that showed up wants regulation on banks, unlike the guy that's been there before. This Romney that showed up does not want to give tax breaks to rich people. This Romney that showed up doesn't want to do anything to Social Security. I think maybe that had Obama flummoxed. Yeah. But when people look at the substance of what Romney said on the debate stage compared to what he's been saying for months and what is on his own campaign w- website, then uh, it could come back to haunt him. Then again, I think a lot of people are really voting for him because they hate Obama, so it doesn't really matter what he says. It's um, kind of perplexing. I don't really <laughs> want to put too much into it. I think things like the jobs numbers on Friday mm-hmm. and uh, stuff like that, that's the kind of thing that will have more impact on the economy. Now, um, we have seen, say, industrial activity go down recently, which is worrisome. But at the same time, consumer sentiment's going up. It's really a hodgepodge of, like, indicators out there. But uh, there does seem to see, there actually does seem to be some bullish news in the economy. When you look at auto sales, when you look at housing and stuff like that, that I certainly wouldn't think recession when I looked at it. And uh, so um, now we have an indication maybe that, you know, energy prices will also go lower, though that remains to be seen. So you put all that together. I think that's the stuff that will really make a difference in the economy, not so much the debates. If the debates really mattered, yeah. then we would have had President Kerry because he won <laughs> his debate by the same kind of margin uh, that uh, that Mr. Romney won his debate. And that's why the debates, you know, they're exciting and they're interesting. Mm-hmm. They don't really matter so much. Has any of this affected the U.S. dollar? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, is this affecting the U.S. dollar or is the U.S. dollar in trouble for other reasons? The U.S. dollar is not having a good day. Probably that's because Europe seems to be getting its act together. Mm-hmm. And so now all the money that, like, ran over here to, like, this side of the Atlantic says, oh, my gosh, and now they're running back over to the other side of the Atlantic. So really uh, what happens with the euro um, has more impact on it than what's happening with the U.S. dollar. But the uh, U.S. dollar uh, has had a good run. But if you were looking at a chart of the U.S. dollar from, say, July, you might think, boy, that thing went into a steep decline. It had a recovery through the month of September. But now it might be going for a second leg down. We'll have to see what happens when it gets down to its September lows. Uh, which is where I think it's going. I think it's going down to its September lows, which uh, should be a temporary boost for all sorts of things. But um, then what happens there? If it breaks down lower, then uh, that's bullish for all sorts of things. But if it bounces, then people say, aha, there's a double bottom in the U.S. Mm-hmm. dollar, and it's going higher, and then they'll want to sell everything. So that's how uh, we get into these situations where we are paralyzed by information. Yes, no kidding. <laughs> because 
there's so much going on right now. There's contradictory information from all sides and trying to find the information that really matters in that maelstrom of all this data is really the hard thing that uh, we're actually trying to do right now. Speaking of the Euro, uh, ECB Chief Mario Draghi taking a page out of the uh, Bernanke playbook during his uh, press conference, saying the uh, bond buying plan has already helped ease tensions, but it's up to politicians to pull the trigger. Yes, well, um, we have seen some improvement in the Euro bonds, that's for sure. And I think that's one of the things that's making the euro look better. And also the fact that uh, Draghi came out and said, uh, we aren't going back on the euro. This is it. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, there's no going back. Sorry, that ship has sailed. We only have the euro. I think that's really putting some bid into the euro because people understand that, you know, Europe will do whatever it has to do in order to make this thing work. And so that's what's really uh, putting some strength in there. And, yeah. I think that what it means is, you know, the Europeans will print to infinity. I don't see why that's so good for the euro, except that sentiment on the euro was so negative beforehand that anything that happens there is actually good. But um, it's not too far away from Europe, and I would caution people to keep an eye on one thing, and that is the border conflict, which seems to be getting worse between Turkey and Syria. Uh, They've exchanged artillery Mm -hmm. shells, you know, which is... uh, not what you would choose to exchange as a gift because they blow up in your face. <laughs> but they have been shooting them back and forth. And uh, now Turkey passed some kind of uh, action that its troops, if there's more trouble from Syria, they can just head in and stuff like that. So it's not like a war declaration. It's like, if you mess with us anymore, we will come over and stomp you declaration. So they have that in place. Things could get seriously out of hand. I know that everybody's working on, you know, smoothing that over. We don't need more trouble over there. We also have trouble with Iran, but it looks like that part of the world could seriously be in some trouble. Hey, and since I'm speaking about it, we saw the uh, people in Iran for months now, they've been buying gold hand over fist through Turkey. Guess what happened to the Iranian uh, currency? It uh, depreciated by what, about 40% this week? It's way down. Uh, 60%, 60%, yeah, and it's like 75% ouch, overall. Ouch. And so I think maybe some well-connected people in Iran knew the trouble that their currency was going to get into, and they got in ahead of the game. Okay. But now we are actually seeing the beginnings of trouble in Iran that could lead to a downfall of that regime. And while many people may think, well, it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of fellows, (laughs) the fact is that destabilization in that region of the world is probably the last thing anyone wants. Yes, they were miserable and awful, Mm -hmm. but they were fairly quiet while being miserable and awful. If they become miserable, awful, and unhinged, then we're all in trouble. And uh, that's something that, again, could put a real bid under uh, the price of oil. In fact, that's one thing that's uh, that's helping oil right now as you and I speak. And uh, also put a bid under the price of gold. So you put all these things together. What do you got? I think that uh, you have the ingredients for higher commodity prices of select commodities okay. um, in the short term as uh, things uh, seem to be getting worse in there. Now, peace can break out all over, and then that takes the wind out of those sails and stuff like that. And that's not affecting things like, say, uh, uh, corn or... Uh, nickel or stuff like that. There are other commodities that are still under intense pressure, and we won't see those improve until we see things happen in China. But I'm glad I moved on to that. And if you want to interrupt any time, <laughs> just go right ahead. Thank you very much, But, but um, <laughs> China is having its golden week now, which means nobody works and all that stuff. However, there have been reports that tourism, you know, inside the country is actually pretty good. People seem more optimistic and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I hate to call a bottom in China because I'm not in China and I don't really know what's going on there, but it seems like even people in China don't know what's really going on there. But I have been saying we may not not have seen the end of the bad news in China, and sure enough, we had some more bad PMI news just recently after I said that. But we may be getting to the point where we can start think about having the end of the bad news in China. And if China can start to put in a bottom, that will form up a lot of commodities that have really been under pressure because people have really been worried that China was going to go south in a big way. I didn't ever think that was going to happen, because I thought that the Chinese would build railroads and highways and water projects from here to Kingdom Come before they let their economy fall apart. Um, And uh, 
we haven't really seen that stress test yet. So, but we might be getting to the point where things will uh, start to improve there. And if that happens, then you could see some strength come into a whole bunch of different commodities. Then again, if we get more bad news and China doesn't pull it out, then a bunch of things like, say, iron, for example, which is the weakest sister of them all, iron could really fall out of bed again. Everyone's saying, boy, how cheap can iron get? It can get cheaper, so keep your eye on that, too. We're talking to Sean Broderick from UncommonWisdomDaily.com here on This Week in Money. And, uh, boy, Christmas, not that far away, less than a couple of months away. Just in time for the holiday, Sean, I got a gift here for you. A 24-karat gold-plated iPhone 5. Well, don't tell my wife about it. That's all I can say. But here's the thing. I always lose my phone. I mean, what would you do, Phil, if you lost that kind of phone? I, I just think that... Uh, at that point, you have to hang yourself. So yes. the the people who will buy that kind of phone, um, not only are they the people who have everything, they have too much of everything. So I guess they will lose it and not miss it and wonder why the maid suddenly took an extended vacation. You know, I mean, uh, that's probably what will happen with that. <laughs> and what if you get a gold-plated iPhone 5, and then you know what's going to happen a year from now? The iPhone 6 comes out. Yes. Then what are you going to do? Well, you'll get it done in platinum or something like that, I would oh, think. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sean Broderick is editor of Red Hot Global Resources and Global Resource Hunter. Check out Sean's blog at UncommonWisdomDaily.com. And you can also find Sean on Twitter, like almost 1,600 folks have, at uh, Sean Broderick. And uh, aware what are of they these all n- hoping to get, Phil? I don't, That's what I don't I'm know. wondering. I, don't know. I just got a whole raft of new subscribers today, and I cannot imagine why. We should be glad. Oh, well, I guess so, yeah. but it's just mystifying me. Really, I'm not that interesting. You're, you're, you're one of the few people who actually <laughs> likes to hear me every day. But, um, you know... That's cool. People can sign up, and uh, uh, they should probably sign up before the next uh, presidential debate, because I'm sure I'll have plenty to say over that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But uh, we are at an interesting time in the markets, and I tend to just put up quick thoughts about the markets on Twitter. So you can find me at Sean Broderick with no E in Broderick, and uh, definitely follow me on there, and definitely check me out at UncommonWisdomDaily.com. I have, by the way, a... um, I just put up a uh, new column with a video because when I go up to uh, all these conferences and stuff, like I was at the Cambridge House Resource mm-hmm. Investment Conference up in Toronto, and I brought my little um, my uh, iPad with me, and I filmed all these short videos with like CEOs, Excellent. geologists, okay. and stuff like that. Well, I just put one up on UncommonWisdomDaily.com today. So, um, you know, people can check that out. And uh, they should find it pretty interesting. Good stuff. Hey, Sean, thanks for talking to us. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks very much for putting up with me. And uh, <laughs> and uh, good luck and good trades to everybody. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Mike Swanson is founder and chief editor of Wall Street Window. He is online at WallStreetWindow.com. And it's always good to have him back here on This Week in Money. Hey, Mike. Hey. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Let's talk about what Wall Street's talking about this morning. The U.S. unemployment rate dropping below 8%, the lowest since January 2009. This is good news, I guess. I mean, it's a nice headline. I don't know if it's real, but, you know, it's, it's a nice headline. <laughs> President Obama saying this morning it's proof the, his economic policies are working. And, of course, Mitt Romney uh, taking the opposite point of view. He is saying this morning, this is not what a real recovery looks like. What's your take, Mike? Well, I mean, you know, a, a real recovery in this. Well, you, normally, when you have a, a real recovery after a recession, you have large dro- uh, job growth, large GDP growth of, uh, you know, four or five percent a quarter for, for for the beginning of the recovery, and we certainly have not seen that. And, and generally, the deeper the recession, the the better the recovery actually is. So I think what that means is we haven't really had a recovery. I don't actually think it's a, a, the fault of the Democrats or the Republicans. Mm-hmm. I think it's due to policies that have gone back for, for a long time, which both parties are pretty much responsible in the Federal Reserve, too. Numbers looking pretty anemic, and some folks are accusing the, the government of cooking the books here. Yeah, well, well that's been a contention for, for years that these unemployment numbers are manipulated, the CPI is manipulating all sorts of economic data is, and and I, I think with the economic or the unemployment numbers, um, you know what what they tend to do is count lots of people as as not being part of the uh, workforce that that because they drop out because they're now filing for disability or they're going to school or or they've been employed for for such a long time that they haven't been able to get a job, but. If you include a lot of those people 
uh, the, the employment rate is, is probably much higher than what, what they claim it is. It could be 15%. It, it's really no telling what it, the real unemployment rate is. <laughs> We're talking to Mike Swanson from Wall Street Window. Here on This Week in Money, and all these good or bad job numbers, depending on how you look at it, they are affecting the markets. The Dow hitting its highest in almost five years. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I, I don't actually think it has much to do with the job numbers anyway. You know, I don't think these reports... Uh, is real or not, I mean, I don't think they mean much. Mm-hmm. Uh, just Let's just assume it is real. Well, like we were saying before, it's not evidence of strong recovery. So then we have to look for other reasons for the stock market uh, going up. And and, it, and I think it's, it's simple. Um, right now, we're in a cyclical bull market, uh, and it's and, and the trend is higher, and the Fed is, is promised to, to print lots of money. Um, going forward, and, and historically, bear markets don't happen until the Fed raises interest rates several times, and there's no sign of them doing that anytime soon. So I, I honestly don't really think what the economy does really matters that much. Mm-hmm. It's more that the Fed's printing money and, and, and you know, the market's going up, and that's all there is to it. Now, most of these economic numbers are probably already baked in, right? Yeah, I think so. Here's a, a kind of a confusing number, Mike. Uh, uh, although markets are high, retail investors are pulling a pile of money out of uh, out of U.S. stock funds. $10 billion in the last couple of weeks. A year to date, almost $100 billion coming out of stock funds and going into bond funds. What does that tell you about investor sentiment? Well, I, I, that tells me that the individual investor is, is scared and, and, and has been scared for a long time. And I understand why. I mean, I, I talk to lots of people. I think they're mistake, mistaken, but there's two reasons they're, they're very uh, cautious right now. One is the economy. You know, a lot of people lost their jobs and they're not making as much money as, as they were in the past, even if they still have jobs. And then people are aging in the United States The you know, in retiring. The, the baby boomer population is entering retirement and a lot of those people are are risk averse because mm-hmm. of all these factors so i think that's one reason that people are skittish about the stock market and looking for more conservative investments to get into the other reason is that they lost lots of money in the last bear market and and uh, so anytime the market dips or whatever they they tend to get scared up again and, and pull out and that's definitely been the pattern the past couple of years. I think they're actually mistaken, but I, I would be frankly scared if all of a sudden people got extremely bullish yeah. piling into stocks, you know, <laughs> but they're not. We're seeing just the opposite. Uh, a lot of folks feeling that uh, markets could be poised for some kind of a pullback. What's your take? What do you see happening? Yeah, I mean, this time of year, usually the market does pull back, and, and we did see the start of a pullback in September. Uh, but evidently, it, it came to an end very quickly, and the Dow's on, on new highs. That doesn't necessarily have to mean, though, that it's just going to surge and, and take off. It could be that instead of a big pullback, what we're seeing is a, a sideways pause in the market for for a month or so. And I do think, though, at the end of the year, that we'll probably get a, a strong rally. And the reason isn't so much because of the Dow and S&P 500, but because European markets are – in particular, are in a position to go dramatically higher uh, going forward. I think they're going to outperform the U.S. stock market. And I think gold and commodities will, too. What about the timing, Mike? Uh, people say sell in May and go away, and we all know that September, October is traditionally not a good time to be in markets. What is a good time to get into stocks, and, and what's your strategy? What do you see going on? Well, I, I'm I, personally, I'm in the stock market. Uh, I, I'm invested not in the United States, but in in European markets and in gold and mining stocks, and I think those are the best places to be. Mm-hmm. But I'm looking to, to buy more and add on to those positions, and in the Dow and S&P are kind of trading along with them in a certain sense. Uh, they don't go up. They're not going up as much as these other markets, but they are kind of trading similar. And my take is that, like you said, sell in May and go away, and, and usually September, October is actually, it may be a, a week time for the market, but it tends to be a, an important bottom or buy point. So that's my view that this is actually a good month to, to be looking to buy stocks and, and average in. And I do think we'll get a, a strong rally at the end of the year that will probably last until, you know, the March, April, May time frame next year. And that, that might 
probably be a good time to sell. I don't think this is a good time to sell stock mm-hmm. at all. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd be looking to sell next year, though, you know, if you want to in the spring. We're talking to Mike Swanson from Wall Street Window here on This Week in Money. The other big story this week that not a lot of Western media reporting, Iran's currency, the rial, falling in value by uh, almost 60% over the uh, past week. The Iranians, of course, blaming a foreign conspiracy. What's really going on here? Well, I, I just actually, it's interesting you mentioned that. I just heard an interview with, with someone that, uh, about foreign policy issues, and they were saying that they know people in Iran that, that are doctors. And... Uh, because of the embargo that the United States and other countries have put in Iran, these people can't even get medicine uh, for sick children. So we're basically squeezing that country, and, uh, and one of the results is that their balance of payments is now out of whack, and they're probably going to have to devalue their currency. To me, you know, if I had the ability to do it, I, I would actually think that would make it so <laughs> this would sometime – this would make Iran actually a good place to put money in invest mm-hmm. because those type of crises actually usually lead to good buying opportunities. If you think about Greece and Europe, that's exactly what happened there. Uh, Greece, is, it, you know, has this terrible debt crisis, and all the bad news came out about that. Their economy is not going to recover for for quite some time. But despite that, the Greece stock market is up about fifty percent since it bottomed in June and July. So these big crashes and currency collapses and all these kind of things actually provide great investment opportunities. But I really don't know of any way to invest in Iran. There's no ETF for it or I don't know of any individual stocks, so I don't know how to do it. You mentioned earlier, Mike, that you're pretty heavily invested in Europe. What's going on there that uh, would make you feel good about Europe? Well, what's interesting about the European markets um, is several of them have became extremely undervalued. They just didn't fall in price, but the valuations for these markets got extremely, extremely cheap. Um, For example, you can use a measurement called a cyclically adjusted PE, which takes the average PE ratio adjusted for inflation for about five years, like a five-year average. And historically, uh, below 10 for for a country is undervalued and above 20 is overvalued and 13 to 15 is medium. Well, the United States got to like six during the Great Depression and, and um, Greece got down to about three during this uh, past crash in, in the spring. And Italy and Spain are around seven or so right now. And Austria and Belgium, which have no economic problems, they're also extremely cheap with uh, Typically, just P's of seven and eight. You can actually buy ETFs uh, for those two countries. Uh, EWK is the Belgium ETF, and it pays a five and a half percent dividend. So wow. those are markets that I'm really interested. Well, I actually got investments in many of them uh, already, but but I, I really think they're going to do well going forward. And in fact, the past two months, they're all up around fourteen percent apiece while the S&P 500 only went up 4.5% in August and September. And I think that outperformance is going to continue in the next year or two. Mike Swanson from Wall Street Window, our guest on This Week in Money. Let's talk gold and silver. Gold almost hitting 1800 this week, falling back a little today. But, boy, it is looking good, isn't it? Oh, it looks fantastic, too. And, and the thing about gold, it, it's got a similar story to these European markets in the sense that gold was in a correction, you know, from August Till, till the spring, and the gold stocks, of course, were too, and they fell really bad. Um, but that correction ended, and now they're returned to being in bull markets, and the gold stocks also became incredibly cheap on a valuation basis, not just simply falling to a low price, but the, the peg ratios, which is a five-year uh, average of the price earnings growth for, for a stock, for Newmont and, and lar- the large cap gold companies, that peg ratio got below 0.5, um, and, and that's about being 50% undervalued on a, on a simple valuation basis. So, um, <laughs> the, the, you know, I think the gold stocks are, are going to double from, from where they are n- are now, and uh, over the next you know year or two years, and 
probably go up even more than that after that. That's encouraging because they've been beaten up basically all year so far. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think, you know, right now, uh, these mining stocks are pretty much the most bullish thing in the market. Uh, in gold, you know, even though it had that correction and it, it bounced back up here, and in, you know, the past few weeks, it's paused also, but it's now breaking out. And, uh, you know, it looks like it's going to go up to its high before the year is over. What's your take on the third quarter? Uh, sorry, on the on the fourth quarter, we are looking at a whole lot of money printing and more quantitative easing coming up around the world. That's got to be bullish for gold, and that's got to be bullish going forward. I think so, for sure. I, I think we could easily see gold prices go to their all-time highs uh, by the end of the year. And that will also be good for gold mining stocks, right? Oh, certainly. In fact, in fact I, I think the gold mining stocks would go up on a percentage basis even more. Uh, again, if you look at August, September, uh, the GDX gold stock ETF went up about 25%, mm. while the price of gold went up about 8 or 9%. So I think that outperformance is going to continue. Mike Swanson, founder and chief editor of Wall Street Window. He publishes a premium trading service called Wall Street Window Power Investor. Hey, Mike, tell me how I can get involved in your newsletter. Oh, just just go to the website, uh, wallstreetwindow.com, and actually have lots of free material, too, uh, that people can see. I, I post something about every single day, and I actually have a list of all of the stocks for free. You can see this for free, what I actually own, and the position, sizes, everything. So it's all pretty transparent what I'm doing. All of this available online at wallstreetwindow.com. Hey, Mike Swanson, good to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to our guests, Rick Rule, Sean Broderick, and Mike Swanson. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Phil Mackesy for AmericanManganeseInc.com. We're back next week with another edition of This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.